All right. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Metro Human Relations Commission meeting. Uh, I think our first order is we need, uh, I think, Erwin, have you been making the motion about the digital meeting? Oh, I have. I'm very well practiced in doing that. I'm happy to do it again. Yeah. Let's see, can you do it by rote this time? Keep your eyes on the camera. No, because they changed it a little bit. So, but I will, I will do my best. Uh, I okay. move that the items on the meeting agenda constitute essential business of this board. Meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans considering the COVID-19 outbreak. And any rule that conflicts with governor's executive order permitting electronic meetings be suspended. Been properly moved. Uh, can we get a second? Yes, back. Second, this is Lakey a man. Right, thank you. We're going to take Chuck. He came in there first, so it's been moved and second. All in favor? If you kind of hold your hands up, and we can count you. If you don't have your screen up, then bring your voice in. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, under the current governor's order, you must take a roll call vote on all action items. That would include okay. this motion. So each person must be asked whether they vote yes, no, or abstain. Sorry. Thank you. No, no, no. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's start here. Uh, Chuck. Yes. Miss Robinson. Yes. Mr. Vinick. Yes. Um, Miss Barry. I'm here. No, um, we have uh, Lethia Mann is on. I don't see her. Yeah, she's here. I'm on the phone. Okay. Am I missing anybody? Um, <clears throat> Marissa. Marissa says she's on, but we can't hear her. Wow. Okay. Um, and, and okay. I'm sorry, you guys. I, 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 for so many reasons, I will be glad when this portion of our <laughs> lives are over. <laughs> Not the least of which is WebEx. I am trying um, to unmute her and she keeps going back to mute as if. Okay, well, go Dr. Richmond, can you hear us? Can you speak? She says she can hear us, but we can't hear her. Well, she's unmute now, so try to speak. We may be able to hear. Marissa, you there? Kenya, can you unmute her? Yes, I, I, I did, and she's no longer connected anymore. Ugh, okay. All right. Okay. I think everyone who did vote voted in favor. And I don't know, Mr. Smith, but uh, the names that were called out, tell me what I need to do here so we can keep this train moving. Well, un under the... Robert's rules, uh, the, the majority of the members present and voting would carry the motion. So uh, uh, having heard no nays, already having received, I believe, two or three affirmative votes, um, I believe you could probably continue. Okay, at the uh, advice of counsel, motion carries. And we thank you. Um, so I'm going to give it to you, Mel. Okay, great. Um, what um, I'm going to recommend that we do is move the old business to um, after our new business um, to accommodate and respect the time of our guests. Um, so a new business is affordable housing update and uh, hiring a new director at MDHA. Um, and we're really honored to have two guests with us 
the chair of the Metropolitan Development and Housing Agency, um, Mayor Bill Purcell, um, and the MDHA uh, current director, um, Jim Harbison. Um, and I know that I believe they're both here with us. Uh, we've checked in earlier. Um, and <clears throat> I had the opportunity to send just a little note to both of them prior to the meeting. Um, I know at our last uh, board meeting, um, there was significant interest in hearing from MDHA on um, the sort of future, the current state and future of affordable housing plans. Um, for the city um, and the process by which MDHA is going to look for and uh, hire a new director. So um, I pass that on to our guests and um, Jim and uh, Bill. Um, I'm not sure which one of you wanted to speak first, but I think um, uh, Mayor Purcell, you had recommended that perhaps uh, Jim could give us some um, uh, sort of stairs for uh, affordable housing um, and welcome both of you. Well, thank you. And it's, this is Bill Purcell and I am uh, I'm honored to be invited. An invitation from Erwin Venick is hard to resist. You know that <laughs> Erwin uh, and I were young lawyers together and he is sued almost everyone I know and very successfully. So I, I immediately said yes. And I realized shortly thereafter that I was going to see Davy Tucker and uh, I was a new lawyer. Irwin and I both had darker and more hair. I think certainly I did. And, and I can remember meeting Pastor Tucker deep inside the jail uh, at, a, at a very early stage in our lives together. And he he let me into the jail and he let me out of the jail. And I was very thankful for that every time, every time that he did that. And I, there, I could go on around this commission. It is a distinguished commission. Avi, you're somewhat invisible to us now, but we all know what you look like. And so it's okay if you keep your camera off, we, we will just, we'll just remember you as you always will be. But we also have not just Jim Harbison with us, but we have Will Biggs uh, and I'm, I'm very thankful that Will Biggs joined us at Jim's invitation. Uh, will is a, uh, uh, an expert in a lot of what we want to talk about today and been working uh, for MBHA. And then you've just seen uh, the camera go on for Jamie Berry, who uh, has many responsibilities, but is the, our communications lead. And, uh, and I spoke with her earlier today and said, basically, after, after the men get done muddling through this presentation, I'm hopeful that Jamie Berry will correct anything that we have not clearly stated to you uh, and uh, that's been my experience certainly and I'm, I'm honored to be a part of the board there. I came onto the board in uh, December of last year. Uh, I think the members of this commission know that housing uh, had been a particular interest of mine now more than, 20 years, more than 20 years ago. I found myself as a new mayor confronting for the first time a developing consensus in the community of Nashville that we had an affordable housing crisis then. In fact, in the mid to late 90s, there was an acknowledgement that we would not be competitive uh, with uh, cities. And more importantly, we would not meet the needs of our people if we didn't do something about affordable housing. And so I created the first office of affordable housing within the mayor's office. Among the first things that I did, we did a survey early on, an assessment of need, uh, realized then, now two decades ago, that we were uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30,000 units short uh, of where we needed to be at that time, uh, and we set to work. Uh, a large part of that was, frankly, the private sector, a large part of that, the nonprofit private sector, and a lot of them were uh, communities of faith, uh, literally of all faiths, came together to work with us first and foremost in terms of the partnerships on preservation of existing units and the nonprofits were especially effective at that. Uh, the city uh, did uh, its part as we were coming off of, uh, frankly, a rather large investment during the Clinton years in housing broadly. Uh, many of you will recall those were the years in which uh, the Hope Six 
uh, funds flowed in significant amounts and allowed us to basically replace nearly half, I think, Jim, of the public housing that had been constructed in the preceding 60 years. Uh, however, that federal commitment changed at that time. And so the Mayor's Office of Affordable Housing uh, began the process of attempting to meet that need. Over the course of the next seven years, uh, we preserved or constructed within the city, uh, and that's not just the city, but private partners, both for-profit and not-for-profit, nearly 26,000 units of affordable housing. And I say all that because I think, first of all, uh, there's no way to know where you want to go unless you know where you are, and there's no way to know where you are unless you have a sense of where you've been. And so the city should remember that we had a challenge, we identified the challenge, and we met that challenge. Uh, it was not, uh, each time is different, and there are obviously uh, pandemics and recessions ahead of us now that are quite different from anything we've experienced before. But I came onto this board believing that Nashville, Tennessee, when it sees a challenge uh, and can identify the challenge, will indeed meet it, especially when it deals with uh, uh, people in our community who have no choice and no other option uh, but to work uh, and be supported uh, and assisted and uh, partnered uh, with, with us. Jim Harbison has been now for seven years the executive director of MDHA and came in at, uh, at a different time with a different set of federal priorities and commitments, but took up the reins quickly and began to move forward with the larger Envision process as well as uh, an effort in affordable housing. And I thought what we might do, Mel, as you, as you suggested, is let Jim uh, sort of bring us up to date on where we are in terms of the need and the uh, the programs underway. I know that he's going to pivot to uh, Will Biggs and let Will uh, update us as well. Uh, Jamie, hopefully, uh, will come in uh, with uh, the perspective from a community-wide, I think, uh, view. And then I will uh, I'll bring a brief benediction and we can answer questions if if you would like. Jim. Um, thank you, uh, Board Chair. Jim Robertson, uh, seven years in the seat here and soon to leave. Uh, I'll try to give you a picture of where we are and where we came from in my seven years. I think the most important thing for this group to understand is that we changed the method of delivering our core mission responsibility, which is federally subsidized income-based affordable housing. And we no longer have, in the technical sense, public housing in Nashville. Uh, that's taken about six of our seven years. It's a major change. It was done through a program called Rental Assistance Demonstration, RAD for short. We started that process in December 2013 and finished in December of 2019 last year. Um, I'll hit the highlights of what that program does. And while though not perfect, it's a much better position for us now um, and why it ensures the stability and financial viability of all of our uh, sites and simultaneously opens the door to allow us to do things like Envision Casey, which I think you see the positive aspects of remediating and concentrated poverty with mixed income redevelopment. Public housing is a 1937 construct in the FDR administration, 1.2 million units in the country, recognized by HUD while I was at HUD, that it was a antiquated subsidy model that constrained public housing entities, roughly 3,400 housing authorities, to a slow decline in insignificance because you cannot keep a pace with repairs because the way the program structured. So what was developed was a, uh, in 2011 was a law that allowed public housing agencies to turn in their public housing portfolio or any part thereof and change to a private model called project-based rental assistance. The key features of the change are that the federal government no longer owns the land, but the housing authority does. So MDHA has received, depending on how you count, roughly a billion dollars in land assets and transfer from the federal government to the agency that it owns now, essentially fee simple. There are some restrictions, but essentially fee simple title. And that allows it to borrow money against these properties and use those funds to rebuild. That's one aspect. The second major aspect is it gives you a 20 year contract with the federal government for your subsidy. 
with an ability to increase that subsidy by the rate of inflation every year. Public housing is only a one year contract renewed each year in the appropriation process called the annual contribution contract. So, without being too much of a housing geek, your housing in Nashville that is income based, and what that means is residents only pay 30% of what they make, the rest of the rent is picked up by the federal government. It is truly affordable. And it's been very important these last few months as people have lost their jobs. They come into Will Biggs, they recertify. And instead of paying 250 or $200 a month, they pay 25 and the feds pick up the balance. That allows them to stay in their apartments. That is our major inventory. And those are the sites that you would find familiar. Chime in, we hail Casey, Cheatham, Andrew Jackson, Cumberland View, where the board chair and I work today, Hadley Park Towers, and the other 22 sites in the city. So the key change is MDHA owns it, has a 20 year contract with the government to run it, and it receives a subsidy that is uh, that can be increased each year by the rate of inflation, and the federal government has to accept that change. That's our biggest change. Simultaneous with that, we recognized that once we owned the land, we would have the opportunity to do something with it. So we created a community-based planning process. And I want to thank Avi for participating at Sudikin and Napier. You saw the value of that process. But we created community advisory groups, starting at Casey. We did resident needs assessment across the entire population. And we let the community decide, what are we going to do here? And what would be the result of that planning process? Well, that took at Casey almost two full years. And that led to a process that, that uh, developed over time to be called envisioning. And its key components that resulted was, first, preserve every unit of affordable housing. Do not get rid of anything. One of the wraps on Hope, Hope 6 was you actually decrease the inventory of subsidized housing. Uh, that was part of the federal requirement. But we said, we're going to keep every unit. We're not getting rid of any of the subsidized unit units. But through infill, through increased density, we want to move to mixed income life, not recreating concentrated poverty. Now, frankly, when we put that master plan together, there was a lot of skepticism in the community of whether that would work. And there was great skepticism on whether we would meet our commitments not to dislocate residents and to preserve all the apartments one for one. And we've done both. And I'm very pleased to say that as a result of the RAD transformation leaving behind public housing, the community based planning model. That in these last seven years, you can just go down the list. George Barrett Manor, new 60 low income units, fully subsidized, fully subsidized by the federal government, new inventory as a result of that. For Patrick Park, 94 units, Mosley on sixth, Manning Place, both over 100 units each, Bosco 3 coming to completion here at Casey, Bosco 3A under construction, Bosco 4 uh, about to break ground, you see the buildings coming down. And it's noticeable as you come down the interstate now, you look up to the right as you're heading towards the uh, uh, stadium, you'll see all these new apartments, all top quality apartment apartments, class A apartments, stainless steel appliances, quartz countertops. Apartment A is someone of low income that used to live in the 1937 concentrated poverty. Apartment B is someone of market rate that's paying the market rate rent, lawyer, physician's assistant. Apartment C, Firefighter, school teacher, nurse, workforce apartments. We didn't really know if people would live together and set aside the preconceived notions that can come with income income differences. It does work. Will Biggs manages it, and we're very pleased to say that Kirkpatrick Park, all of ours that we started, we've proved the concept that mixed income living, replacing concentrated poverty, will work. People of higher income will live next door to someone of lower income, and they really don't care. Um, so what we've achieved, I think, over a period of time will be important to the Human Rights Commission since after air, water, food, shelter is right there as a human need. And I think that's why you have such a vested interest in it. Um, we've accomplished something that's sort of unique in the country. We changed our entire portfolio from an antiquated model to a more modern one, modern one, securing our resources. We've used those assets not for benefit of anyone on the board or the employees, but to improve the lives of our residents by putting them in a new community of mixed income, while we've increased the inventory of workforce units and increased the inventory of affordable apartments. So I think that's quite a, 
quite something we should all take pride, but it doesn't mean the work's over. It's a marathon. This work takes years to accomplish. And at Casey, we're probably about 30% complete. Although, frankly, we're ahead of the master plan schedule. Uh, other accomplishments in this period of time, I'm really pleased to report our dialysis clinic. MDHA is the only housing authority in the country to have its own dialysis clinic, but it's a training site for our residents. It allows them to come in, many of whom had no high school diploma. They hire on with Sanderling Real, our partner. It pays them $12 an hour with full benefits. They go to school, they get their GED, they get their patient care technician certification, and they get a real job at 18, 20, 18, 30 an hour wearing dialysis machines in a clinic that caters to our residents. That's working quite well. Um, we'll finish Curb Victory Hall, uh, our second uh, dedicated site for homeless veterans. Uh, that ribbon cutting is next week with the help of private donations, low-income housing tax credits, um, support uh, from across the community, um, as well as uh, Harper Cove Flats in Bordeaux, where we uh, have the first workforce new housing in our inventory. So, uh, in short, the rental assistance demonstration stabilized our finances, allowed us to have set aside a reserve fund for all capital needs for the next 20 years, allowed us to start a rebuilding process that can extend across the community over a period of time, and sets us in a better place for our residents. Um, but the work's not over, and we'd appreciate any support you can give uh, this agency in the future. Um, but for me, it's been a very uh, rewarding seven years, and I'd be um, remiss if I didn't say um, it's really not about me, it's about this great staff. And while I might be the present and soon to be the past, the future of MDHA is in its employees and its residents. And one of the ones I'm really proud to introduce is Will Biggs, a friend of mine for quite some time uh, from HUD, and he is one of the many superstars here that will live long past me. Tennessee State graduate, lawyer. He ran for me when I was director of HUD, the largest portfolio of project-based real assistance, almost 18,000 apartments across the state. And he has been successfully managing this very difficult transition from public housing to new form of subsidy while creating for the first time in this country, really, successful property management of mixed income life. And so with that, now that I set you up a little bit, my friend, <laughs> I uh, talk about how great you are. Will, if you want to pile on anything I missed, and uh, I'd like to thank Mel and Avi and my many friends on the Human Rights Commission uh, for your support. Uh, it's been the most meaningful uh, experience I've had in a while. I'll leave it at that. Will? Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Harbison, for that fabulous introduction. Uh, thank you, for Mayor Purcell, for inviting me to participate in this discussion, and thank you, Human Rights Commission, for uh, allowing me just a few minutes of your day. Uh, Mr. Harbison did a, a really thorough uh, history, I guess, of, of where we've been. Uh, I think it's important, uh, Mayor Purcell indicated where we come from, and I think, the, uh, I would say the lessons that we've learned from the past is that uh, for the past 80 years of operating a, a public housing program, with uh, concentrated poverty uh, in large developments, uh, I think we can say the lesson learned there is that that's probably not the, the best model of uh, development going forward. And so uh, they mentioned the envision process, which is this community based uh, uh, planning process to get everybody engaged. And you have targeted developments like we have here at Casey. And we have discovered that mixed income is the future, I think, for MDHA and the developments that we have. Uh, Mr. Harbison mentioned the five new developments that we've completed. Uh, we also have three additional uh, developments currently under construction. And so those will be coming online anywhere uh, in the next uh, six to 12 months. Um, we have, uh, in the past, I think 40% of those units have, are deeply subsidized. 20% uh, of them are workforce and the remaining 40% of their market rate. And that's the mixture that seems to work well to allow us to get the, uh, the proper financing and be able to support the debt service that comes with these new developments. Um, we are, um, we moved away from the public housing model, which in my, from my perspective, makes us just like every other management company in the, in the city. And so uh, our focus going forward is training our teams uh, so that we have uh, some of the best trained, uh, best qualified staff uh, anywhere for any management company. Uh, that's one of our goals. And we're also transitioning our folks 
to what I call a hospitality mindset. Uh, we've got to be able to provide the exceptional customer service that uh, residents expect. And, and that's a, an ongoing training process for us. And so we're doing that. But our, our goal is to continue to serve the low income citizens of Nashville. Uh, we understand that that's our mission, even though we're, we're venturing into some of the mixed income development and serving uh, some different clientele. Uh, our core mission is to take care of the, the, the least of these, the low income families in this city who may not have an opportunity to be housed where not for our programs. And so uh, that is uh, who we are. We've not forgotten that. Uh, we just, we're just expanding the portfolio a bit. And uh, if I had to characterize RAD, Mr. Carpenter gave you the detailed explanation. Uh, essentially what it does is it moves us away from public housing and it transforms us into a conventional property. So we're just like everybody else. Uh, we've got uh, rents and debt service and fixed income and operating expenses, uh, you know, just like any other property community in this town. And so uh, we, we've got to employ the same business principles as everybody else in order to be successful and, and to continue to operate these properties uh, in a way that uh, we'll all be proud of them. So uh, I think I'll, I'll stop there pending your questions, but uh, Thank you for the opportunity to to speak to you and share a little bit about what we're what we've been doing here the last few years. And Jamie, from your perspective. I'd love to just add a few things that I think that we've done that I'm super excited about. Um, we created a pilot in 2016 and we have assisted with 1446 affordable apartments um, being brought to Nashville, either new affordable apartments or preserving current affordable apartments. And there are currently 2,792 that are under construction under the pilot program. So the pilot program is something that I think um, is something that we always wanna talk about because it's such a huge success story. Um, a few other things just worth mentioning. Um, it has been mentioned about Randy Rogers Apartments. That will be opening up next year. And that is 100 mixed income apartments. That is 50 new subsidized units coming to Nashville, as well as the remaining 50 for workforce and market rates. So again, 50 new subsidized units coming to Nashville, which we're super excited about. Um, 10th and Jefferson, you may remember, opened up a few years ago. That was 54 apartments, and 15 of those were set aside for our Section 8 vouchers. And so the remaining 39 were workforce. And of course, um, I, I know Jim mentioned Curb Victory Hall, but we are super excited. And if anyone is interested, I have been sending out virtual invites for that event. We're obviously, because of COVID, we have to um, make sure that everyone stays safe. But if you have not received a virtual invitation from me, but are interested in watching that live, please reach out to me. And um, Melody, are you able to send my email out to the group? Just in case, okay, perfect. Yes, I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> Thank you. And then one of the things that we started doing a few years ago, I've been with the agency for about six years, and we recognize that, of course, there's a great need for affordable housing in Nashville. And so one of the things that we started doing um, is that we started um, creating some waiting lists for each individual property to give people opportunities to be on multiple waiting lists. If you remember, let's say five years ago, we did a contemporary waiting list, which had five properties and you did you applied for once for that. And then we had seven family properties that you applied for once. What we've done now is we've basically broken it out to where all of our 21 properties has its own waiting list. And so that way, anyone that is in need of housing can apply for 21 plus waiting lists. That doesn't even count our Section 8 and our project-based vouchers and things like that. And so we have been actually opening those waiting lists on a period on a very regular basis. In fact, I think we've opened up waiting lists almost every month this year already. And we have waiting lists that will be opening up in November as well as December. And so opening up more frequently to give people an opportunity who need housing now, affordable housing now, which we know the need is great, as well as allowing there to be additional waiting lists, more waiting lists so that there's more opportunities. So just wanted to mention those things because I do think that as we think about the need for affordable housing, providing people with an opportunity to get on those waiting lists is a big help. 
And I, I ha I'm open to questions, but I think that's all I have as well. Well, I, and I and I think we should move to questions, but I, I'll say uh, a couple of things quickly. I, 20 years ago, it was clear to me. 15 years ago, it was clear to me. It's clear to me now. Uh, the a need for affordable housing, uh, the need for housing in especially the successful cities of America has never been greater. And uh, while this is a challenging time for cities broadly, uh, we also notice that the, uh, the housing inventory for purchase uh, is down. The housing prices continue to go up, even in the midst of pandemic and recession. Uh, we see uncertainty in the, in the apartment market, uh, but said straightforwardly, the need, as you've heard from each of us, is great. And the city of Nashville, MDHA is part of it, is not going to be able to meet that need alone in the years ahead. Uh, it is going to take the entire community. It is going to take uh, a, a, a concerted effort, again, focused on in the way that Jim and Will both described uh, the, the broadest uh, uh, cross-section of our population. And uh, that is right in front of us. There is, I think, um, the opportunity as well for greater federal uh, and other uh, types of support in this area. And there are certainly different opportunities on the table as we move into this next uh, period in our national life. I don't know what the next month will bring, uh, but I have uh, the hope and belief uh, that it will bring uh, investment again uh, across this country in infrastructure broadly, but specifically housing and opportunities in this space. Uh, that's what I, that is my hope, and I leave it with you, as I suggested, Pastor, by way of benediction, uh, at the conclusion of these remarks. Uh, I am I'm very optimistic about the models that we have introduced in Nashville and the prospects for them. But the need, whether it's, and there are different estimates in this regard, but uh, the last uh, formal estimate made showed, again, an affordable housing gap anticipated to approach 30,000 units. The need to replace uh, the housing, which we know, I was just at Cumberland View this morning, 1967, I think, Jim, it was constructed. We have units constructed 20 and 30 years before that. The need for us uh, to, to, to meet the needs of this community and the people here uh, is, is great, is real, it's in front of us, and we have to work together to, to meet that need. And pending uh, any questions, uh, I join my colleagues in thanking you all for hearing from us, but also for being there all the time. Uh, uh, year in, year out, uh, mayor to mayor to mayor, and they've, they've been coming and going a little quicker lately, but uh, the, it, it, you, you, the Human Relations Commission is there, and Jim Harbison in particular uh, would say uh, that you've been an enormous help to MDHA, uh, especially at, at times when the community needed to understand and we need to understand the community, and that at the core of it is why it's so important that you all do what you do, so thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mayor Purcell. Um, it, I want to make sure that our questions about what you've all discussed so far um, before we move to a sort of second um, sort of topic, and that's the, the hiring of a new director. Um, but it, commissioners, um, you want to, if you can raise your hand or speak up if you have um, a question. Marissa, do you have your hand raised? Uh, no, I was just trying to say that I was here. So uh, that uh, I can hear. And so I know I was having technical problems. I was just alerting you that I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> and and that's okay. a very nice presentation. Well, I definitely do appreciate the um, in-depthness of the presentation. This is the most I've heard from MDHA uh, 
in one sitting in many, many years of listening to things. And am I correct in my takeaway that one of the fundamental changes was made in the funding mechanism? So instead of uh, subsidizing housing coming from the government per se, properties were deeded over to the city that are then leveraged to finance these projects, which would mean that the pace of the work is based on the financial viability of a particular project? Uh, that's uh, partially true. There's a couple of gaps. Uh, so the federal government funds everything. So this is still U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development money. It just comes in a different appropriation from Congress with different rules. But part of those rules are, you're very correct, and, and I, I conveyed that properly, that MDHA, and MDHA is not part of the city, it's a separate entity. It owns the properties, and as Will said, we're, we're having to run a business, but within that business, we can use the land value, just like if you own a home, you want to get a, a new kitchen, you get a home equity loan. We can use the value of the land to bring down a couple of financial assets that were really not available to us before. One is debt, but money either conventionally or put insured loans. The other is low income housing tax credits, a tax credit program that's uh, very generous, and that's been our foundation for the new development. So it's still federal money, but the difference is the MDHA board, the MDHA entity uh, owns these parcels uh, with no restrictions on the deed. And because of that, they can go to a bank and use that property uh, as security to borrow money that we, to Will Biggs' is a good point, we have to pay back by running uh, a good organization. Um, and then the speed of which we're able to do that is really constrained by two factors in, in my view. Um, one is we have made a commitment not to disadvantage residents and we hold that close to our heart. So at Casey, no resident has been put off the property. They've lived here and as units naturally attrited we kept them open, which means we took a hit in our business, and that allowed Will, when the time came, to clear out a whole block and move those people in that block, but still remain at Casey going into an open unit elsewhere. And that's how we started the program. Now we're at a tipping point where people are just moving from old to new. So that's really our speed is tenant relocation without disadvantaging residents, combined with the financial aspect. I hope I answered your question. There's a lot of detail there, but I hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. And so I guess my follow up then would be under this current structure. Um, if you had your druthers, what needs to be done to pick up the pace when you're talking about adding 50, 100 and 150 here? All these are great. But when we know that this need is 30,000. Well, again, I, I, I think I'm the safest one to answer that because I'm a short time. All right. So this is more an opinion, um, and I think our board chair alluded to that. Um, while we are running as a business, we're not a rich business, right? I mean, every penny that we're able to squeeze out uh, in, in what we call cash flow uh, goes right back in to close loans. So the cash to close loans has been our largest financial shortcoming. And uh, a year ago, a different administration uh, addressed that with a, with a great promise of largesse of pretty substantial funds that would have greatly accelerated this. So simply put, to answer your question, simply we need cash. And that's why I'm hopeful, and I'll be blunt, I'm hopeful for a change in administration and a commitment to a large infrastructure program and allowing us to get more grants for cash to leverage with our low income housing tax credits and loans to really pick the pace up. So it's simply cash to close loans from my seat and stand financially. Um, Commissioner, other questions? Um, I know our, our friend Avi Poster has a question, um, Avi. Is this the right time now? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, Jim and Bill, I'm not on the commission right now. I rolled off about a year ago, uh, but these are many of my best friends. 
Um, Jim, just just huge congratulations on a great portfolio of success while you've been at MDHA. And special thanks for your, your looking out for people, especially with um, compromised situations like people with developmental disabilities and providing them with independent housing opportunities you've been great i guess my my question is even in the hope of a new administration re, 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 I, the, the two things that i think the commission as well as advocates could work with bill and his board and mdha would be yesterday the mayor agreeing to moving forward on a strategic plan, a 10 year strategic plan, which we're hoping will be like San Antonio's and maybe we can get David Schwartz back to help us. I'm just some thoughts on that. And the second one is to you and Bill, could the M could MDHA and the Human Relations Commission work hand in hand to go back to the state and address inclusionary mandatory inclusionary zoning? We were right there. We passed it as a city. The state turned us around. You spoke courageously to the state about them not turning us around, but they did anyways. I'm wondering if Bill and Mel and others can join together in going back and getting that passed. We're building tons of, of private apartments still in the city and condos, and we're just not getting that share that we were hoping to. So what are your thoughts about going back to the state and our working with you on the strategic plan? Uh, Lobby, thank you. And uh, yeah, we did have a, a long day in front of the legislature a few years ago. I'll defer to my board chair. He has so much more experience in the state legislature and frankly, navigating the political waters. I'm not, uh, I think most people know me in my background. I'm, I'm more of a military uh, oriented person from from you know, education and training and you know, my heart certainly in, uh, with our people, but I, I really don't have a sense of how that would work in the future. I do think we gave it our best shot. Um, we came up short. I'm always optimistic that other good people can take it on again, but I, I'd leave it to the board chair about that future possibility. I think it's probably more appropriate and especially with his background that he addressed it. Well, Avi, uh, this is Bill Purcell. Uh, if you want uh, significant change in the near term, and you can define near term as you will, within the foreseeable future, years as opposed to decades, uh, I think you have to go back to the beginning of all of this and recognize that the investment began with the federal government. The investment brought the resources of the country to bear uh, to provide housing and your largest opportunities remain there. Uh, that was when there was, and it's not 50 years ago, it's 21 years ago and 25 years ago, when there was significant federal investment, you were able to move in literally half a dozen, six to eight years. Uh, and it may not be the model anymore that would be your priority or your choice, but with with major federal investment, we were able to move more efficiently, quickly, and successfully than almost any other city, Jim, I think, with with making the changes that at that time we thought needed to be made. Uh, and I understand that your particular targeted interest in that policy, it will not make the massive changes that uh, that you want in terms of large numbers of transformations uh, now that we have this control over all of this land and the ability to do it. But my, my focus would be in investment, both, both public, especially national, uh, and also private in the partnerships that MDHA has. Uh, that's where I put my priority. Uh, we, we, that was a tool that was particularly, I think, important at a, at a time in our history. Uh, but we didn't have it 20 years ago. I'm not sure when we'll have it, if ever, in, in the state. And my energy would be directed uh, elsewhere. This is Mel. I have a, a, a follow up question, if I might. Um, it was talking of like dedicated funding for this work. I think you're absolutely right. There was a time when 
there was significant um, building affordable housing. Um, and I, I do absolutely hope that we can get back um, to some of that. But um, in the interim, I know that there are other cities that have built sort of the political will, so to speak, um, to go to the people, right? Um, Austin, I believe it was a $260 million uh, GO bond issuance um, approved by referendum. Um, so, you know, I'm just interested if you think um, there are other uh, financial avenues that um, are promising um, and that constituents might want to know about so they can do some of their own research and advocacy in those regards. Well, I'll jump on for the present and then I'd really ask the board chair to address the future. Just for context and uh, background, MDHA is the recipient of a large amount of federal money for building new housing called low income housing tax credits. THDA is the Tennessee Housing Development Agency, Ralph Perry, and the previous, this governor, the previous governors have been very good about giving us tax credits. We've gotten more than our fair share, seven, nine percent tax credits in a row, roughly $70 million uh, of securitized money from those tax credits. And that's a whole program I could spend time with, but we have gotten support from the federal government, but through a different lane than just cash. We get credits, we have to sell them on the market, Coca-Cola buys them, gives us a check, et cetera. So that does exist. And the federal government did create the RAD process and did essentially transfer all this land. So we shouldn't ignore that they have been uh, generous and have been supportive. Um, and I'd have to compliment, we haven't gotten, obviously everybody wants everything, including me. We haven't gotten every dollar we wanted, but the Dean administration did put up $11 million over about a three year period. The Barry administration pledged 25 million that the Browley administration actually delivered to us. And the Randy Rogers project on Rosa Parks, in my opinion, again, soon just be a private citizen opinion, is the model for how you can do this. You have city money that is the cash that allowed us to close loans in concert with low income housing tax credits and new federal subsidy for the monthly rents to create a whole new mixed income community. And that could be done across, I think, large across these properties that MDHA now owns outright that are antiquated, Cheatham, Andrew Jackson, Cumberland View, Sudokum Napier, where we have an envision program, Edge Hill. And that could be a real payoff and those dollars in the city could be leveraged. Now, whether that's possible in the future, I, I think it is because we have evidence, evidence of it in the past that we didn't highlight maybe as we should. We have gotten support from the city, not in the amount I always wanted, because I'm always wanting more, but they have supported us and the federal government has supported us. But I think where Mayor Purcell is correct is if you look at the possibilities of the future, there's some real, really great opportunities out there. And that's really, by his leadership, I think will be essential in hoping to bring those to bear. I'll leave it to Bill to, to sort of clean up whatever I stepped into. Oh, I, I, I think Mel uh, and everyone on this call, everyone uh, would like dedicated funding for every good thing. Uh, I sometimes, I, my parents, I for some reason didn't think of dedicated funding for me. And so uh, here I am at my office right now. Dedicated funding is something that we all would like. Transit, schools, uh, there are mechanisms that uh, are available under state law for referendums, for increases in the sales tax, which raises a whole other set of issues uh, that I think, uh, in fact, the city of Nashville uh, most recently considered in a referendum. On the other hand, Williamson County, in fact, did raise its sales tax for schools. Uh, and they are known and they are uh, a matter of law and they're a matter, matter of experience. At the end of the day, there's federal money, there's state money, and there's local money. There are resources at each level. There are tax credits, but that's just another way for the federal government to deliver resources uh, to, uh, to uh, things that they want to support and fund, to be frank. And then there are opportunities for, for private investment uh, that meets uh, these other needs. As you may recall, 
Now, at the beginning of this century, uh, we incentivized the construction of uh, uh, both housing, uh, both apartments and condominiums throughout the core, uh, the Viridian, the Encore, Fifth and Main, uh, the Lofts on Second, uh, the Gulch, uh, and Avi will remember those were all incentivized by the city. Uh, which in, in the condition was 20% of all the units in each of them were to be affordable. That was a mechanism we used at that time. But at the end of the day, when the great progress has been made, uh, is when uh, as much of those three branches are on the same page about the importance of the issue, they bring the resources to bear in a coordinated way, involve the private sector to support that effort. That's the way this is going to move forward. I'll put one more because I must. Uh, it's not a condition, it's, and it's not an asterisk. It's more than that. This is uh, the lowest tax big city in the lowest tax state. And uh, as you know, until last fall, we were in a very, very difficult situation in the city of Nashville. And the council did, I think, not just what the mayor wanted, but what they perceived the city to want them to do. Uh, and in front of us now is uncertainty in that regard. Uh, and so, Avi, if you wanted to know, and if you wanted to, you know, a place that you need to focus attention, it is on the prospect that there will be an opportunity for the people of Nashville to weigh in on the things that are most important to them. Now, what is the court going to decide? I don't know. Is it going to come before the people? No one knows. But at the moment, whatever you can do to have the people of Nashville understand uh, that they have uh, they had a, an, an extraordinary, historic, and and worrisome challenge a year ago uh, that would and 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 were we to uh, not face this challenge going forward, uh, we will be not just back where we started, but frankly, uh, somewhere behind that. So uh, we, have, uh, we have plenty of right in front of us, a couple of weeks, next few months. But with the, your help, with your building of consensus and cooperation, I, I'm, I'm hopeful in this. And I'm hopeful because, frankly, when we understood it 20 years ago, and we had that kind of support, that, that the size of the support that we had, at that time, we met the needs, and I know we can do it again. But we're going to have to get over a couple of hurdles in the nearer term in order to get there. Um, if there are no other questions on that point, um, I know that at our last meeting um, of the commission, uh, Mayor Purcell, there was some interest in hearing about the the process by which um, you a new director and what kind of community engagement you anticipate around that process. Well, I the I have appointed uh, a group of people, some of whom I think, if not all of whom, will be known to you, uh, to lead us in our transition planning. Cynthia Kroom, uh, Dr. Cynthia Kroom, who has now run the uh, uh, Metro Action Commission for two decades, uh, came to MAC, you may know, from THDA, where she was Director of Development, uh, and so has uh, housing experience as well as obviously 20 years of managing uh, grants uh, and programs that are very much in the space that MDHA does, is the chair of this working group, this transition team. Dot Shell Berry, some of you will know Dot Berry, uh, was the first uh, woman to lead our, uh, uh, to be the commissioner of personnel in the state of Tennessee, uh, the first uh, woman of color to be our uh, uh, our own personnel director here in Nashville, and before that ran Metro Social Services during my administration, has, is a member of that committee. Dexter Samuels, uh, vice president at Meharry Medical College, uh, past chair of the airport authority. Hank Helton, who ran the mayor's office of affordable housing, during my administration, and Eileen Behan, uh, who was the council member for East Nashville, Casey and, and uh, Edgefield, uh, and Lachlan Springs, but perhaps more importantly known to you as the person who, who uh, was so important in the leadership of Catholic Charities 
over many decades uh, together with Bill Sinclair, her husband. So uh, that's the committee that is that is advising us and thinking about what we did before. Previously, I'm told seven years ago, they used the Center for Nonprofit Management uh, to conduct a search uh, involving Jim. Uh, and uh, we'll see. I, it is, uh, I, I think it's important, and I'm glad the commission's asking about it, because I think it's important that we get it right. Uh, and in my mind, there'll be a, a transition time. I think that's what they'll recommend to us in an interim. Uh, and then we'll move into a, uh, into a, a search process that will, uh, one hopes, uh, involve uh, lots of people. But in the meantime, if you have uh, ideas, people, if you, you know, if you, uh, if your mother once told you when you were very young, you know, you would be an outstanding director of MDHA uh, when you grow up. Uh, if there, there's no way for us to know that without you telling us. Mothers don't usually share that broadly. Uh, then you should certainly, you know, advance that notion. Encourage people who are interested. Uh, to 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 make sure they share with us their hopes and dreams for themselves and for the agency, and they can do that by communicating with Cynthia or Dot, Dexter, Hank, or Eileen. And I really appreciate you all. I know you have a some other things. You have certainly you have to get back to old business, and, <laughs> and, and and you're an old commission at least in years, not not yourselves, but the commission itself has been around since. Almost the Old Testament, I think. So anyway, it's it's been around a while. So, uh, so with your with your permission, uh, and with my thanks to Jim and and Will, Will, anything else that you would like to add that we missed here? No, sir. I think uh, you guys covered it quite well, and uh, I, I don't have anything of value I can add to the great comments you already made. Well, if you all have seen, Will Will took me on a on a tour today and Jim and, and Jamie uh, of uh, Cumberland View and then of, uh, of Hadley uh, Tower. And uh, if you could have seen the relationship of Will Biggs and, and our whole executive team with the maintenance workers and the property managers and the folks there, uh, you would have had a good feeling about a team that works together, that knows each other, they, they know who they serve uh, and, uh, and their, their commitment is, is real. And, uh, and Will Biggs is an important part of that. So, Thank you all very, very much. Well, thank you all very much. You were really gracious in giving us a lot of your time today. Um, and um, I do just want to do a quick shout out to Jim Harbison, who I have had, uh, as you all have said, a couple opportunities to do some, some hard work with Jim. And um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate everything. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Richmond, I think that you're um, with us now. Okay. Do we need to go back to old business? Um, that's that's correct. Um, hold on, let me open. Yes, we actually, um, we skipped both the financial update um, and old business to accommodate um, our guests. In that case, you can go back to the... Um, I, I will just give a, a quick update. Um, earlier today, I emailed um, commissioners the um, our budget accountability report for the quarter, um, and um, that document that I shared with the commissioners um, is also available on our website publicly um, for for the public who are listening and also would like to review that. Um, the upshot is um, 
You know, we've had a lot of opportunities for saving um, during this period um, where most of our stuff is virtual. Um, and so we have had the opportunity to, um, as we've discussed, think about other ways um, to use money. Um, to, to this point, um, we have only spent 21% of our budget um, while we're 25% into the, the fiscal year. So um, there was a question from the mayor's office um, around, you know, what kinds of savings could be done in the event that we would have to do reductions as a result of the proposed referendum. Um, and given the size of our budget and the size of our staff, um, anything approaching a 30% reduction um, would be significantly painful. Um, I don't think we would be able to meet that kind of reduction. Um, we certainly would not be able to meet it without layoffs or furloughs, and that would be plural um, in our case, because even a reduction of our discretionary funds, we would still have even a single layoff wouldn't get us to 30%. Um, so that's, you know, we'll, as uh, Mayor Purcell said, we're going to wait to see what the court says um, about the proposed referendum if it is on the ballot in December. Um, but I did just want to give you guys a heads up on what the impact of that would be. Um, for your office. Any questions from anybody on that? Reflects a 30% decrease. Is that what you were saying, Mel? Yeah, uh, in the event that the referendum um, is on the ballot and passes, mm -hmm. um, there is the po the distinct possibility of a thirty percent reduction. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We move on. I was just uh, just one other question, uh, Commissioner Richmond. Uh, yeah, when is this referendum slated to be heard? What's the or what's going on with that? What's the timetable on that? So my understanding is that um, the election commission voted to seek a declaratory judgment. Okay. Um, on the constitutionality or the legality of the terms of the uh, referendum as written um, to their voting to, um, uh, you know, approve it for, um, for a, a special election. So I, I don't, I, I don't think we know the timeline for the court. My, my, it's already been filed, and my suspicion is that um, you know everyone involved is going to be seeking a uh, resolution um, in court. Um, but if, as it stands, the the request was to have that referendum. Um, a, you know, by the election commission approved for a special election in December. Okay. Um, so we're just waiting for the court. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. Is there anyone else or are we ready to 
to all. Well, hearing no other questions or comments, let's go to old business. The uh, roadmap for something then. Yeah, I did just the another public thing to um, community oversight board um, partnership on our four um, community safety town halls um, and for the work that their staff did in consolidating the comments um, from community. Um, we had a you know really good engagement with the community on those town halls. Um, you know, overall is, um, you know, it, around, you know, two, at least 200 constituents, um, engaged in, um, in each 1, um, and they're still available. Uh, on YouTube, and I want to thank you chair Richmond for, um, being so gracious with your time and hosting. Um, three of those four uh, community town halls. Um, and, you know, we sent a, we sent the report, both uh, me and uh, Dr. Jill Fitcher, our uh, director Jill Fitcher from the COB, uh, we sent that consolidated report to the mayor's office. Um, with our hopes that the information that we gleaned from from you know the community in that process um, will be uh, important and will be uh, will be able to be part of the conversation um, in the hiring process. I just wanted to know, and, and if there was any questions um, or comments. Um, think that with the conclusion of the community safety town halls, uh, I don't believe I have any other um, instruction um, from you all um, in terms of participating in that process, um, other than simply, you know, remaining an advocate on, you know, the concerns that you all have. I just want to say, I think it's excellent, great work. It brought another voice to the table. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Richmond, for exercising your leadership in that. Um, I just think the more voices that gets that get to this table, uh, the more hopeful I am for a good choice. So, no, I, I think all the time and effort was well spent. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I uh, thought the uh, all four were were excellent, and all the comments that were made from all across national were. And, uh, I hope that the um, this will be. Um, Yes, I am happy to do that. Um, as we talked about, um, there was a grant um, to the city from the Cities for Financial Empowerment and to the Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund uh, Consumer Financial Protection Initiative. Um, and we had agreed to uh, consider taking um, the rains complete that project. Um, it had been housed in the mayor's office. Um, currently, there's just just shy of seventy thousand dollars remaining in that fund, um, and the Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund has um, officially approved um, having the 
uh, that project transfer to uh, Metro Human Relations Commission. Um, and the idea is to use the remainder of that fund to employ a consumer protection fellow um, for a year. Um, and that would be at least 75% of their time would be spent on that project. Um, I do also want to say thank you to our legal counsel for agreeing to meet with me tomorrow um, to talk about the, the, the logistics of getting this done. Um, it's going to require um, some legislation in Metro Council um, and approval. Um, to extend that grant period um, and because the original legislation um, placed the project in the mayor's office, uh, we're just going to have to figure that out. But um, we're in good hands with um, with Derek Smith and Metro Legal to help us through that process. Um, and I didn't know if there were any questions about Thanks, it. <laughs> Look forward to tomorrow's meeting. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, Chair Richmond, if uh, I know we only have just a few minutes left, um, there were a couple other projects that I wanted to update you all on. Um, one in particular. Um, Thanks. Uh, Sarah, are, are you with us? I'm here. Great. So um, as part of a director's report, um, I've asked Sarah to please share with us uh, the plan that my crafty staff has been working on um, on this community reading project. Um, sure. Um, hi to all the commissioners. Um, and yes, as Mel was just saying, I'm about to give a quick update on uh, the project that we've been working on. We have a name. Um, we're calling it Just Conversations. Um, and on one hand, you know, just implies they're centered around justice and equity. But on the other hand, it's also recognizing that at the end of the day, this is um, these are just conversations and it will require much more um, than conversations to work towards like a truly anti-racist society. Um, so it's just holding both of those things and that's how we decided on the name. Um, so we've been working on a number of aspects of the project in these past few months. The timeline, establishing partnerships, um, trying to decide the platform on which the sessions will be recorded and shared, as well as the funding. So just some quick words on what the project is looking like now. Um, we decided to proceed with Ibram Kendi's book. Uh, we do want to stay true to how we lead all of, our, all of our projects, which is in a way that centers and is led by community members. So the way we are doing that is um, Kendi's book has 18 chapters and we want to have 18 different conversations, which are each going to be led by different community partners that address anti-racism from different perspectives. Um, regarding partnerships, uh, we have reached out to several community partners and we now have 18 partners that are on board and very excited about this project. Um, on the topic of platforms, um, initially we really wanted to partner with N NPT and we pitched the idea to them. However, they didn't have capacity to take this on right now. So now we're looking to partner with a local production company that will be recording and editing each of the 18 conversations. Um, and then on the topic of funding, we also explore different funding options um, and we've decided to proceed with the Metro procurement process. Um, so we've put out an RFQ and we are in the process of receiving bids um, and all the bids are due at the end of this week and we'll be making the decision on um, which local production partner we'll be choosing uh, at some point next week. Um, regarding timeline, we're hoping that all of the interviews will be completed uh, sometime mid-November to end November. That's what we're looking at. And then in terms of when we'll be publishing the videos, um, we were thinking because if we're wrapping up the, the filming in November, editing will take at least a month. And so we were thinking maybe we'll just wait for MLK Day early next year, um, which is then followed by Black History Month. And so that will make a good time to um, start releasing these videos. 
So those are some of the quick updates. So uh, if I may speak, I'm, I'm very excited to hear about this. Uh, this is great. Uh, I just want to remind uh, the commission that Dr. Kendi will be speaking at the Christian Scholars Conference at Lipscomb University in June. And if there's some way to engage uh, this with that project, with that conference, I think it would be a good thing. Thank you so much for that recommendation. I think that, yeah, I think it would be a good tie in. Um, other things quickly, uh, important things on uh, my director's report. Um, you know, Celebrate Nashville is one of the big projects um, that our office assists with every year. Um, obviously, this year it looked um, very different um, because of uh, you know, COVID, um, I'm, give, you just give me one second. I want to open this document. Um, you know, Mark Etherly in our office, the director of um, uh, operations and special projects, he does a lot of the work um, planning Celebrate Nashville. Um, and this year on October 3rd, um, you know, it wasn't at Centennial Park with a thousand people, um, but I'm excited to say that the program, the online program included real time uh, live Kurdish language and dance and concerts and um, all kinds of stuff. In overall, um, there was over 130 people engaged in Celebrate Nashville Day through all of the various platforms. And to me, like, that's pretty incredible. Um, and if you haven't watched the uh, Celebrate Nashville Film Festival movie, um, I, I really recommend it. It's, it's really moving. Um, it will make you... It will make you proud of Nashville. Um, so it, I know I've sent that out in and I'm sure that you all um, have a link to that. Um, and lastly, um, I will be spending, as I said in an email to you all, I will be spending a good deal of my time in the next month, month and a half, working on the Nashville, um, what they're calling um, the Nashville Human Rights Stakeholder Group as part of the city's application to host the, um, the World Cup in 2026. Um, and FIFA requires um, all applicant cities to submit um, a pretty robust human rights report on you know, what challenges, uh, what human rights challenges does the city currently have, um, what challenges are going to be exacerbated by an event the size of a World Cup games, and, and what plans we have to mitigate um, or to improve some of those challenges. Um, and uh, I, I'm a big part of the conversation. Um, I'm on pretty, I'm on all of the subcommittees at the moment. Um, but I think one of the most incredible things about the process isn't just that, you know, we might be able to host a World Cup, but here we have an opportunity through this process to build a human rights report um, with stakeholders from all over the city, including, you know, business, nonprofit, um, 
you know, they're all coming to the table to help um, draft this. And so I think it will have value. That report will have value um, going forward, whether or not Nashville is selected as a World Cup city. So um, that's why I feel like it's important for me to spend some significant time doing that um, if, in the next month and a half. So in that regard, um, I would really love to hear from each of you. I sent you the initial um, consultants report that we received from FIFA. And if you would please look at that and either by email, uh, send me ideas, concerns, um, you know, from your individual um, and community experience and um, or email and let me know when I can do a, a little phone interview with you. Um, but I think I, it would be really important to hear from you all um, as part of the process. Um, that's what I have, uh, um, Chair Richmond. All right, uh, thank you. And and but I am and and of course uh, invested in this, so I'm uh, I'm excited about this. Whether we get the World Cup or not, although I certainly hope Nashville does. Uh, but I, as you were saying, I think it's uh, a positive. And I know uh, in putting the, the the last World Cup in Russia and the next ones in Qatar, and both have uh, human rights record. Something that's new, but I applaud them for doing this, and I think it's good for Nashville to go through these problems. Does anybody uh, have so uh, either any other questions or comments before? Um, hi, this is Quibi Pretorius. Um, I and I um, wanted to give a shout out to um, Chair Richmond. She was quoted in the Tennessean this weekend, um, and she talked about the training that was provided by the um, Metro Human Relations Commission to, um, for the Police Academy. And there it is, and to help make Nashville a more welcoming city to all. Yeah. Well, and it. Yeah, editorial. We had, um, we had been listening to the um, community town halls, and so he followed up and uh, and hated idea. Right, and um, I. I wanted to say one more thing is if you head on over to the Celebrate Nashville website, um, with all the excitement last month, we were actually, the South Africans in town a month ago, we were working on putting together a Jerusalem dance challenge in which it was a song that started in South Africa and just went global during the pandemic. And um, millions of people are taking part in this dance challenge, and we were busy finishing up our Nashville version of the Jerusalem dance challenge when the Celebrate Nashville festival came up. And so we quickly finished it, and I managed to get it on the website, and it was part of the Celebrate Nashville um celebration so if you we managed i don't know you guys didn't know that the south africans in town we have our very own professional zulu dancer that we wrote in to be part of it and so he took our performance to the next level and so we were were very proud to be part of um, the celebrate nashville dance party also well, it, let me just say thank you so much for that, um, uh, Commissioner Pretorius, and <laughs> she's been quite busy, you all. Now, I have to give a shout out to her um, to say that uh, Commissioner uh, Pretorius has delivered five carloads 
clothing and linen, washcloths, hotel soap, diapers, wipes, shoes, all kinds of stuff to the shelter at the fairgrounds. Um, 425 cloth masks, uh, 350 of them um, provided by uh, Commissioner Yesbeck. Thanks so much, Chuck. Um, two brand new computers um, and another one do and, a, and a used computer. Um, and she has driven folks um, from the shelter to go early vote. Um, and all the folks know that Quibi is there um, and is part of the Metro Human Relations Commission. So she's making us all look generous and good. Thank you so, so much. Thank you very much. My goodness. <laughs> Other announcements any, from anyone? I want to chip in one more time on the topic of people going to the polls. Um, if you, we, we're part of a group of folks volunteering to drive people to the polls. And so if we have, we have tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday, um, to with that, we're going to continue taking people, but not a lot of people know about this service. So if you know of anybody. Um, I'm sorry, Avi left because he actually may have known of more um, like friendship house that may have needed some rides. But here's the I'm going to give you the phone number. If you know of anybody who needs a ride, it is 615-669-8119. So if you need somebody who needs or know anybody or any place that needs have people that needs rides, please call 669-8119. And, and who's the organization doing this? This this is the um, uh, Davidson County Democratic Party. Okay. Thank you. Any more announcements before we go? The, the only thing I would add um, uh, is our next meeting is December 7th, um, and I believe that that's going to be in person unless the governor's executive order has been extended, and I didn't know that, or in the event that the governor does, in fact, extend um, between now and then. And I will be out of town on between November 9th and 13th, um, and I will be working part time um, while I'm away, but with limited internet access because I'm going to deal with family stuff way up north in Michigan <laughs> where they don't <laughs> have very good internet. <laughs> Mel, just one question. Um, this, 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 Meeting. Go ahead, Janice. I'm sorry. Um, I was just clarifying. You said December 7th is our next meeting. We are not having it or we no, are we, having it. We are. I'm just saying that at this point it would, it will be um, in person um, unless okay. something but, the governor's office changes. And, and that, sorry. And that day is typically, uh, the Nashville International Human Rights Day celebration, December 7th. Do you know if they're having it this year? Um, we are having it. I don't um, and I am, I should be able to tell you exactly what day we are having it. Because I know in the past, it's always coincided with Pearl Harbor Day for whatever reason. And I just didn't yeah, know yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Though we are not having that in person. We, the okay. United States celebration, um, we're planning a, a virtual event. Okay. Last call for announcements. <laughs> Hearing no, we'll take a motion to adjourn.
I make a motion to adjourn. Fires a second. Aye. 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 <laughs> Aye. Any opposed? I declare us adjourned. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Oh, my God.